Hey, welcome to the 374th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patrons Josh Hansborough and Kenny Beaumont. I'm Matt Enlow. And I'm Warren Kaplan. And today, uh, it's Matt and me again. Yet again, we failed to uh, secure a guest. Not be- I mean, we've literally had like Eva Longoria pitch to us for for Hot Ones, her mm-hmm. Flaming Cheetos movie. Steve Yedlin was supposed to be on the podcast. You know, Ryan Johnson's DP. And we just uh, have not gotten it together. We got things to do. Anyhow, so it's just Matt and me. But also, our last couple episodes, have uh, we've gotten some some good feedback. Yeah, they've been hitting, hitting pretty hard, I think. This is how we do them. This is a pitch 101 quick quick mini mini lesson you get on a zoom call mm-hmm. or in our case google meet you come up with a word mm-hmm. come up with three topics based on that word mm-hmm. you do not use chat gpt for it because you get real crappy mm-hmm. generic examples but you come up with three things you care about based on that word and then you record a podcast about it are you on a paid account chat gpt4 or are you on the free I, I was on the free one yeah that one can barely pass the bar I also use the free one, which is probably why I'm over it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's all generic and bad, so. Yeah, but also insanely amazing. Chat GPT programmers aren't listening. You're not going to hurt their feelings. I'm not worried about their feelings. No, it, it is. To me, it's like on par with social media. Like when Facebook came out and everyone was all of a sudden connected to everyone. And there are all these new apps and games and tools and things and ways to sell things and way to buy things and way to plan events and all these like it completely changed the way we interact with each other uh and you know and it was super spammy for a while Mm -hmm. and i feel like that's ai is like the new thing it's like the person that's like hey give me 365 facts about real estate uh and then i'm gonna post one of them a day on instagram Mm -hmm. like it's it's creating so much spam right now you know yeah. Like useless stuff. And I've already, you know, I Google myself every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've already, you know, found so many, like I'll Google, you know, just shoot it podcast, Orrin Kaplan, just to make sure, uh, you know, my mm-hmm. mom's still listening. All the, all the blogs are from her. It used to be, but now it's like, we're on all these lists of like top 30 filmmaking podcasts. And like, those are all written by AI bots, I think. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm annoyed by AI right now, but I, I'm hedging because I do think that anything we say about it today will no longer be true. Anything that we say it can't do today. Like I see all these people on the writer's strike line saying like, Hey, I can't write good dialogue or whatever. And then like it, it can, it, like it will, you know, <laughs> will it be able to mine its own personal childhood traumas? Yeah. Which was another joke I saw on the, yeah. Like the guy that wrote the, the King's thing. speech is like, AI yeah. doesn't stutter. So it couldn't have written like the King's speech, which is true, but because the King's speech has already been written, <laughs> now it couldn't write, write the King's speech. Um, so it, yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing. So AI, hate it, love it. It's interesting. I really, I'm really enjoying playing around with it for like image stuff. Anyhow, today, the word that we have chosen to speak about is directing jobs. It's the one, it's the thing that I think we all care about. I think this applies to writers, applies to actors, applies to anyone in a union that's about to strike or is on strike right now. Yeah, we're going to talk about three different ways you can get directing jobs. Uh, hopefully they apply to people at all sorts of stages in your career, whether you're repped or not repped, whether you're a new filmmaker, a veteran filmmaker, whether you uh, went to film school or came into this sideways as an engineer, whatever. We're trying to come up with topics that apply to everyone and that hopefully are helpful to everyone. And very much we hope stir some discussion because based on our last few episodes we've gotten people commenting and um telling us what they thought about some of our topics like about management or about three ways to present yourself as a director is directing a viable career all these things uh hey as a quick side note should we have a discord no we cannot even keep up with our instagram like with putting our episodes on instagram have a discord I'm just saying there's not a good forum for people to, uh, yeah, it's called email or Twitter interact with each other, not just oh, with us. each other. They, they don't want to interact with each other. I don't they know. have enough on their plates. You were just talking about how it stirred up conversation, conversation with us. Yeah. That's the only conversation we need. Well, everyone let us know if you want to be on a discord, a live show. That's you how want people to start get to talk a, start to each a other. Discord or a subreddit or something. I don't know. 
this live show you've been threatening to plan for the last two years. I'm going to drop dead before I get this thing planned. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, we're going to talk about how to get directing jobs. I think it's going to be a good conversation. Who knows? It's a little bit off the cuff of our pants. Is that even, <laughs> a little off the cuff? But, Strap uh, in, everyone. It's going to be a good one. <laughs> but uh, I think, it, you know, we'll talk a lot about how we've gotten jobs in the past and hopefully uh, that applies to someone. And it, and it really ties into all the, the previous. This is like our um, the Neapolitan. What's the what's Ryan Johnson's uh, trilogy? The Corn Julio trilogy. What's it called? It's Edgar Wright. And it's the Cornetto trilogy. <laughs> yeah. So this is yes. like our trilogy. We had an episode about... I would uh, love the Cornholio trilogy, <laughs> though, which would be Mike... That's Idiocracy, Beavis and Butthead, Do America, and... In Silicon Valley, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we we talked about being repped. We talked about presenting yourself as a director. We talked about whether you can make money in this career, which we think you can, but we're still not 100% sure. And then today, we're going to talk about that element of getting the job that gets you the money and is related to mm -hmm. all those other topics. But before that, mm -hmm. we I've been TV dying to know, calls. <laughs> before that, I've been dying to know, Matt, what have you been working on lately? <sighs> well, so uh, what have I been working on lately? Um, kind of two, three different things. My job job, which has been going great. Not super interesting. My personal project, you've seen Witness. I've become obsessed with building a cowboy tub in my backyard. And I swear this pays off in some some sense. I've been uh, just trying to get my backyard ready for the summer. Um, trying to make some stuff that's fun for the kids. We're going to have people over eventually, all that stuff. And I've just been, I think obsessed is the an accurate word for the way that I've been behaving. Literally, like all of us, when we like want to buy a new coffee maker or something, we're reading like reviews about mm -hmm. coffee makers for like months. I've been putting like hard labor in. I dug a trench for the electrical line also like literally on my hands and knees from as soon as my baby is asleep until it's insanely rude to my neighbors. I'm just putting it like leveling up, uh, moving dirt from here to there, sawing boards, all sorts of stuff. Um, and I, I wonder if some of it is that practical thing of like, um, trying to just get ready for the summer and wanting to clean up my backyard and all that stuff. And some of it maybe is just like pent up energy of like not doing this for so long or I don't know, just being kind of career obsessed and neurotic for so long that like I'm finally like, I'm going to do something else. And I just go crazy. Does that make sense to you at all? Yeah, of course. I've always thought that creativity is like a thing that everyone has that everyone's creative and that mm -hmm. making things is important. And when I was an engineer, was worked with super creative people as a filmmaker, you know, everyone's creative, I think in construction, super creative. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, that we crave making things and seeing the results. And in, mm -hmm. uh, the film, if you have a career in film, if you're a writer, let's say you've written five features and one, two of them almost got made and one got sold and nothing mm -hmm. has actually been produced. It can be really draining on your soul. Uh, but if you decide you're going to install, build a new deck in your yard and you figure out how to do it and you make the plans and you get the materials and you put them together and you cut them and whether it's an amazing deck or just an okay deck, you see your, your idea yeah. get produced and it's like yeah. so satisfying. And then you have friends over and sometimes I've gotten more satisfaction from like friends coming to see like the backsplash we put in the kitchen than I have from like comments on a short film. You, you know, you came over to pick up a just shoot it hat that I found in my garage and storage and your kid, my, this cowboy tub is nowhere do, near done. It was dangerous. I was like very worried that like your toddler was going to slice his finger open or something. Yeah. And a cowboy tub, it's like a small pool in, in case yeah. you have no idea. Yeah. Which like I a didn't know. A glorified kiddie pool. Um, you know, they're big in the Southwest or like, you know, like uh, Joshua Tree, Austin. It's literally, it doesn't matter. The point is your kids were excited and it was not anywhere near completed and it did reinvigorate me. I was like, oh, that's right. This is going to be fun. Yeah. And it, it's so much better than saying, yeah, I'm working on this movie or this script and no, no one ever sees anything. Yeah. So it, I've gone a little crazy. 
um, on the film side, uh, things are moving, but the the strike has made things a little weird for everybody. And uh, I thought we could talk about it a tiny bit because uh, we're kind of like preparing to go out to talent and kind of like uh, I'm waiting to hear back on you're talking about Some your movie. financial stuff on oh, my movie yeah pardon me thank you um the one that i've been working on for a long time some fundraising documents are getting in order this you know it's, i'm in the stage now where things are moving along it's all producerial stuff and i'm talking to a handful of different people and you know a whole bunch of emails to all the different people who've been working on the movie so um so that's great but the the strike has made it just feel precarious or strange or just unsure of like, oh, is this, you have to question every decision you make. Is this scabby? Should I not do this? Is it bad timing? You know, if you go out to actors, the SAG strike, if it happens, would start June 30th. It's May 28th now. So it just makes everything feel like it's all hanging in the balance and a in a strange way you uh i think especially because you're so embroiled in commercials in the moment you're not thinking about the strike in the same way like i'm literally driving past multiple picket lines all the time and i'm just like ugh, ugh. yeah you love crossing picket lines it's not really my style <laughs> never uh, uh never you just, I'm pretty sure that's what you just said. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it definitely, affects, like, I'm super interested in it. You know, like, mm-hmm, every night mm-hmm. I'm paying attention to the deadline yeah, and I'm yeah. reading, like, the latest strike news and I yeah. want to see what the deal is. And I, uh, you know, I have a sense that it will, you, you know, the, it affects directors and actors and all this stuff. Um, and, it, it, we have we have the exact same question as writers. I mean, the whole reason we did an episode a couple weeks ago about whether this career is viable is because of that writer strike, and it's mm-hmm. it's the same thing. We do a ton of free work. I mean, you've been working on this feature. You said, yeah, for over a year, year and a half. We made a bet at the beginning of last year that you uh, would shoot it by the end of the year, and I won that bet, fair and square. Uh, and uh, you have not been paid at all. On the contrary, you've spent money sure. on the movie. Sure. And writers do that when they're writing spec and actors when they're auditioning. So it, it's a really, really tough career. And there are a lot of people in this career, too, you know, super mm-hmm. competitive. So I do think that there's something about commercials that they're just related enough where it's the same skill set, you know, in, in a lot of ways, uh, especially on the directing side as working in film and TV. But the it's just a totally different business model Mm -hmm. ecosystem too yeah and ecosystem that it it does make it a little safe i mean it's not safe from the economy like the beginning of this year when no one was spending any money on anything uh commercials were suffering too but um but what's interesting is i'm getting just a lot of random emails from editors dps people yeah dude that are working on tv and film that are like hey my show's yeah. Not shooting, so if you've got anything, let me know. I'd yeah, love nothing, to do some commercials. Nothing makes me more panicked in, in, than getting like an email from someone who I like very much, but I haven't talked to in a few years, being like, "Hey, you got anything?" Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I think, like, for me personally, the strike, like, just in the most blunt of ways, is it. I do feel like it gives me access to maybe some pretty incredible crew people that yeah, are sure. available all of a sudden and just looking for work. It also makes my job way more competitive. Like all these like big mm-hmm. TV and film directors mm-hmm. are pitching on commercials all of a sudden, like my friend uh, was pitching on something and she's like, yeah, uh, it turns out I'm pitching against Catherine Bigelow. Like, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. because you know, she can't work on her movie or TV, whatever she's working on, she'll just do a commercial. So there's these like celebrity directors that are all of a sudden in the mix on mm-hmm. these commercials that are, I'm not talking about like $10 million commercials. I'm talking about like, you know, $500,000 commercials. So it's helping and it's hurting, but obviously I hope it gets resolved soon. And I, I am interested to see how, like if it shakes people out that just like, that's it, you know, hard thing about it is like the complaints of the writers are that they can't have a sustainable career 
they're living paycheck to paycheck and now no one's going to get a paycheck for as long mm-hmm. as the strike goes on. Right. So there are people that will probably be broken by this and just quit the yeah. business. Yeah, absolutely. I'm hoping it gets resolved soon. I feel like it won't just cause I don't, you know, like I still turn on the TV and have way too many shows to pick from. Mm-hmm. So I feel like the studios are not in any hurry to solve this, but uh, at some point yeah. they are not going to have anything and uh, they've wasted a ton of money and people, you know, I, I don't know. I, I saw the little mermaid today. I, I know that movie's doing really well. Like people I think are very interested in mm-hmm. the stuff that we do. It's just things need to kind of fall back into balance and we'll see Yeah, how long it takes. Well, fingers crossed. Um, Oren, I've been dying to know what have you been working on lately? I've just been, I've been pitching and a friend of mine met with this production company and told me some interesting stats, a, a commercial production company about, uh, submission, about just the numbers of, mm-hmm. uh, directors and submissions and everything. So, um, I'd heard that at this company he met with, they, they have a roster of, you know, a, a few different directors and they, you know, in commercial, in the commercial world, ad agencies want to make commercials, they look for directors, right? So, and then they get directors submitted. So this company submits about, um, each director about 100 to 150 times a year. Mm-hmm. And they expect off of that number of submissions to get about 20 shortlists, which means that your director has been chosen to pitch on a project. Um, right. Usually they're one of three directors is like the most common scenario. And th- out of those, shortlist opportunities out of those 20 shortlist opportunities they expect the directors to win about 10 of those opportunities so Mm -hmm. they're hoping that on average their directors get to direct 10 commercials a year uh which i thought was an interesting stat like uh, like one a month is kind of the the biggest goal and yeah and i so now i've just been thinking a lot about like whether i'm gonna hit that Um, yeah i mean i think you probably will and it's funny when you pitched this idea a little bit, I was like, oh yeah. To me, the thing that stood out is like, as a person who loves doing commercials, but like didn't plan on them being my bread and butter exclusively. And then now kind of going back to more narrative work and, and being pretty happy about it actually. Like, I miss commercials. I bet in a couple months I'll really miss them because I miss the budgets and the crews and the pace. You know, there's so much to love about it. But um, but I kind of had a, a sense for me personally that like I wasn't going to book more than 10. Yeah, probably 10 spots would be a pretty incredible year for me. You know, I don't think on my best years I booked 10 big honest to goodness spots i did much much more work than that but like you know a vfx job or you know a short film or you know a branded thing here or there or whatever like you're talking like 10 commercials yeah and i'm and i don't mean like you know 10 campaigns i guess yeah 10 campaigns yeah 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 yeah. not not um not actual pieces of content right yeah yeah four spots and a cut down and a lift and a tiktok doesn't count um I just knew that I probably wasn't going to do more than that. And you can kind of do the math on like how that's going to net out in terms of time commitment and financially and like the the size of the spots that I'd been doing. And that's kind of why I was like, Oh, I I should change it up a little bit. If I'm going to make, if I'm going to be uncertain for a certain amount of time and I'm going to make this much money even though this is a good amount of money, maybe it makes sense for me to take a paycheck from a different source, basically, and diversify a little bit more. Yeah. So have you looked at like, oh, if I did 10 spots a year at your mm-hmm. current rate, let's call that 20 days of shooting. Do you think that's accurate? Some days are two days. Some days are one days. Probably. I probably average one and a half days. One and a half days. Okay, great. So then, so then 15 shoot days a year. Yeah. 
at your rate, do you feel satisfied? Do you, does you've crunched those numbers? You're like, great, I'm okay with that. Give or take a couple of days on either side. Yeah, it just it really depends on what my rate is for those days because there's a difference between getting five grand a day, mm-hmm. where that is now seventy five thousand dollars, right, mm-hmm. or twenty grand a day, mm-hmm. where that is now like three hundred thousand, right? Like, yeah. One of them, you can live very comfortably in LA and the other one, like you can't, uh, own a house, you know, or like, or support a family. No. So yeah, I think like I would still need to do some like VFX jobs and some, you know, I'm doing a writing job and some other directing things. Yeah. So this year so far I have, I've had five directing jobs, four of them were commercials and uh and i'm shooting next week so it'll be june so i'll be six by june so i'll be i'll be on track for one Mm -hmm. to one you know one one per month on average but then i'm going on vacation for like 20 (laughs) days i saw on twitter this thread like a couple months ago where some writers this is pre all before the strike saying hey when do when do you all take vacations and are you ever afraid that you'll get a job when you're on vacation and that's a totally normal question. I wasn't surprised mm-hmm. by the question, but I was surprised by the answers, which I would say 90% of people said, I don't take vacations because of this exact thing. Yeah. I mean, have you ever cut a, a trip short because of a job? I haven't, but my wife has many times, like many times. come back a many day times. early for a callback yeah. audition that well, ends and up we're, going for nothing. We're talking about like you're in Palm Springs and you drive back a day early. Yeah, that I wouldn't like fly back from Europe, but, but, but nowadays, you know, for auditioning and pitching, I would 100% do it remotely, you know, like yeah. I would pitch remotely and I would yeah. do an audition remotely and I would even start a job remotely. So I was pitching on this thing that would shoot in Latvia, I think I might've mentioned on the podcast. And, uh, if I would have gotten that, my whole family is going to Israel on June 20th and that would have shot June 22nd in Latvia. So I would just fly to Latvia, shoot it for a a couple of days mm-hmm. and then join yeah, my family yeah, yeah. in Israel. I would do that, but like, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't cancel the whole thing. And we were right before we started recording, we saw this like Michael Keaton clip on Instagram where he says like, you will regret, you will never, ever, ever regret hanging out with your kids. Like sure. You might turn down mm-hmm. a job, lose a job, whatever, like hanging out with your kids is like 100% something you will never regret. And, and I try to think about that you know, not necessarily about kids, but about, you know, my, a lot of people in my family remind me this all the time, but like in 10 years, uh, will you remember this? Like, sure. Whatever, like Kleenex commercial that you did. And I'm like, absolutely. And I will not remember this park play date. So (laughs) I'm doing this Kleenex commercial anyhow. So I forget how we got on this topic, but, uh, yeah, that's what I've been, been up to lately is, uh, contemplating everything Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) as usual well i think we should change our show to be called contemplating yeah yeah complaining with that in order um uh anyway let's segue into our main topic which is divided into three parts yeah getting jobs getting jobs so the first one on our list the first category of how you get a job is an open assignment um, that one, I think probably people are the most familiar with. That's like, oh, uh, you know, there's a thing out there and we need you to pitch on it. So in a commercial right. situation, we need a director. We need a director. Right. Like, or, and you just outlined with commercials, pretty straightforward. Uh, we covered it on the show plenty of times before, but that's also obviously the situation for if you're up for a TV show or, uh, you know, an unattached, like an open assignment on a directing job for a feature, though those are fewer and farther between now. It can even be you're in some thesis class that you're mm-hmm. in your film program and they're going to choose five of the 15 students to direct mm-hmm. uh, these five shorts that have, sure. were written by the writing MFA students. And you're right? like, wait, we're all spending the same $150,000. How come only five of us get to direct a movie? I know that seems like such a ripoff yeah. from film school perspective, but, but yeah, but I guess in terms of if we focus more on ways you can make money as a director, getting a directing job, uh, that's, that's the first one. And I think to make a consistent living of getting jobs this way, you do need to 
have some sort of representation. You do need to have mm -hmm. someone representing you and finding these opportunities for you to pitch on, right? So either you're part of a production company, it can be your own production company and that has clients and agency relationships. You can have an agent, a TV agent that finds out about a show that needs directors, right? Uh, I think that one is probably the way that most like kind of journeyman mm -hmm. directors in Hollywood make a living, but it does require that you... Yeah, you need have, access have of, some, of yeah. some sort. And I think that you and I have both in the past had careers that resembled that model um, with and without representation. So it's not like it's impossible, but I think that especially as you get higher, the further along in your career and the budgets get bigger, the, the more guarded that access is basically. If we're, you know, back in the day when we were just like making YouTube videos and stuff, like there were more open door opportunities. Yeah. And or you could just pitch your friends, you know, you'd meet someone at a barbecue or at a party or something. This way to get directing jobs is not great for the beginning filmmaker, right? Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because the beginning filmmaker tends to not have a big network of people that mm -hmm. are looking to hire directors. Mm -hmm. And they also usually don't have yeah. yes a body yeah. of work to show to get the job. And when we're talking about in those social situations, whether that's at a party or your manager, you know, setting up a general, a good wing person needs a little bit of ammo. They need to be like, oh man, Orin just had his, uh, you know, his video just went viral. Or Orin's uh, show just got nominated for a Golden Globe in the first season, whatever it is, like the hype person right. so that you don't have to say they that stuff. They won this festival, yeah. Yeah, well, whatever it is, yeah. Um, and so if you have, if you don't have any heat, if you don't have any talking points, that can be really tricky for someone to set you up, you know, right. Or he's got a great personality. Thank you. Uh, and the thing is that the reps have that exact same issue, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of times we talk about how newer filmmakers don't really need reps and it's not that they don't need reps. It's just the the rep is just going to find the most obvious way to sell you and mm -hmm. try to sell you to on these open assignments, right? The rep's job is to know about people looking for directors and to say like, hey, you should hire Matt, you should hire Chrissy, you should hire this person that has is is perfect for this job because mm -hmm. look at this other thing they directed and look at their life and look at their background and look at all these things and You're where they're from. Them. Yeah, And so it's hard to have that body of work when you first start out. And so that's why agents and managers don't really know how to pitch you. Right. And right. that's why there's no point in you trying to get an agent or a manager or, you know, maybe, maybe a smaller commercial production company, but even, even a real small commercial production company, is, it's hard for them to convince people to want to hire you mm -hmm. as a director. If you can't show what kind of stuff, you know, what your work will look like. Right. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's move on to the next way to get a directing job, because I think the open assignment is probably the, the most well covered of all of our. Yeah. But it's also like the last, the, the hardest one to mm -hmm. reach, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. We should have yeah. probably done these in the reverse order. <laughs> well, here we are. So number two, getting the in-house job. Mm hmm. In-house directing job. So this is... Pause just for a second. You said in-house directing job. While those jobs do exist, I think more commonly there are jobs that encompass more than just directing, and but you end up building a reel because the projects that you're working on need a director and you are in the building. Just, to cl just as a right, right. call out, like if you're looking for these jobs and you keep saying like, I want to be an in-house director. I want to be an in-house director. And like none of these places have those titles basically. That's not, right. the, that's not to say that there aren't people directing the things that they're making. Yeah. I think there are places that have staff directors, but they have the same issue as number one, right? Which is no one's going to hire you as a staff director if you don't mm -hmm. have a great body right. of work, Right. but someone might hire you as a, a staff writer yeah, sure. Or a Staff coordinator. Yeah. yeah. Or something that you can show them some samples, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. anyone can have writing work to show, mm -hmm. right? If sure. you, you just have to write it. Or be well liked and show that you're eager to do work that no one else wants to do. 
that can be part of it as well. Yeah, totally. Uh, and we've both had these types of jobs, right? Mm-hmm. The in-house job. I was uh, full, a full-time at Disney, which I got off of, you know, just some short, some web series I did back in the day that I had pitched through just some friends of mine had, had told me about a pitching opportunity. Um, and then I was full-time at this company, Window Seat. That was a production company mm-hmm. that did a lot of advertising. And basically, we never pitched various directors. I just directed all the work that was there. Yeah. I, uh, you were at Window Seat for the first year or two of the podcast, I feel like. And at the time, oh, yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I kind of didn't understand the gig you had. And now the roles are kind of reversed. Yeah. No, it was a pretty cool gig. I was kind of in charge of creative brand strategy, Mm -hmm. (laughs) directing. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, we had a producer that was more in charge of, we had like a head of production that was in charge of production, but I was kind of in charge of creative and it included the writing and directing and editing of the stuff we were making. Yeah. And we had a kind of interesting client was Quiznos, which was was our big client and we did Mattel Hot Wheels also. And so those were our two big clients and they're all famous brands that everyone knew, but they're not necessarily like big budget, like advertising Mm -hmm. brands in any way. So we had a lot of leeway. We didn't have huge budgets, but we got to, I think Mattel also just like makes so much advertising. Yeah. They also advertise to, uh, sure. They advertise to kids and people and parents and stuff, but they, have a huge, huge, huge division of advertising that is aimed at people that buy toys like Walmarts, like Mm. toy stores, Mm -hmm. like, um, schools that, you know, uh, there are a lot of companies that buy a lot of toys to at wholesale to resell them Mm -hmm. target. There's like these big toy conventions where people are like, Hey, check out our cool toy. This is going to be the, you know, toy of the season for black Friday or for Christmas or whatever. Um, and those, they would spend sometimes more money on advertisement for, for that, that type yeah, of thing. Sure. But, uh, but yeah, so the in-house job. So just to be like the most, as obvious as possible, like, you know, the way I think you could go about getting this type of job is, uh, going back in my day, we would go to Craigslist. Mm-hmm. I think, I don't know if that's still a Li- thing. LinkedIn now, I think is the way. Yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah. There's Facebook, there's the Mandy.com. There's, there's some social media sites built around film employment, but I, any I of think, them good? I think, no, I think that what we're describing, they live slightly outside of the crewing ecosystem, right? Like when you're trying to get a job as a gaffer or whatever, it's all just kind of word of mouth. Basically it's like, you know, who, you know, and who's hiring and you just kind of get, you know, you become part of a crew and you just kind of get calls and right. referrals and somebody drops out and you you know your name comes up these sorts of jobs tend to exist in a more corporate space you know mm-hmm. um and so hiring managers aren't like hey or and who do you know who could be an in-house person maybe, maybe they are but they're also kind of for legal reasons and for all sorts of other reasons going out to a broader network of people um, and posting, putting them on job sites. That's not to say that like you still, and anyone who's applied for a job in the last few years knows this, you still have to like work your angles, you know, like you need to have a friend in common, put in a good word, that sort of stuff. Like no job I've ever gotten, whether it was a corporate gig or a, referral to a directing gig came without some sort of connect. But your current job, you didn't know anyone there. I did. I did. I had a, uh, I realized I had worked with somebody at a previous directing gig, saw that they were in the, the, at the company and was like, Oh, Hey, I recognize I didn't know you were at this new company. This is great. Hello. Lo and behold, I got an interview that next day. Oh, cool. Yeah. Team win. I didn't know anyone. Hmm. Can I say this about LinkedIn? Actually, this is maybe interesting for people. So if you apply to any like corporate job now, a bot basically is scanning your resume and like like looking for keywords and, you know, basically 
culling the compatibility so that the hiring manager is only looking at the like the most qualified candidates, quote unquote. And I think that my resume, which is probably true for most people's, is only really impressive to the human eye, right? Like you can see my credits and be like, oh, I've heard of those shows. But a bot doesn't know who Key Key and Peele Peele are. You know what I mean? And so I think that I tend to have a better hit ratio when uh, a human being is looking at my resume for sure. Well, well, first of all, I want to state that I believe that there are way more jobs like this than people realize. Mm -hmm. And that this is a really valid and interesting way into the film business. And also for a certain personality type or. Yeah, you can't be anti-corporate like overly artsy fartsy. Yeah, 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 definitely. Though artsy fartsy doesn't necessarily mean you can't work in a corporate world. What I mean is like. If you grew up where your parents had job jobs and the idea of not knowing what your next paycheck was, where your next paycheck was going to come from, if you're just like gigging around as a freelancer and you've got bills to pay, there is an appeal to this style of job for sure. Yeah. But I think it's a great, like kind of also when you're first starting out, it's if you can get a job like this, it's great because you, yeah, exactly for that reason, you're not like worried about paying rent you might even get health insurance Mm -hmm. and you'll be almost like apprenticing you know Mm -hmm. in some regards and yeah maybe sometimes you're going to make a birthday video for the ceo right Mm -hmm. but um but there there is a layer of stuff you call it bs yeah 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 you're not going to be super excited about every project or even most projects realistically Yeah, but it might be an opportunity like, hey, we want to do this funny video video for the corporate convention, you Mm -hmm. know, or we Mm want to make this commercial or a demo. And it's just an opportunity to practice your filming. It's like, you're like, hey, why don't we shoot this on Alexa? Why don't we get a dolly for this? Why don't we cast some actors for this thing? Why don't we, you know, get like really good makeup? Like you can really start honing your craft and getting paid to do it uh, and you know, hopefully you're not alone in the department and there's mm-hmm. other people you can learn from or you can hire your friends. And yeah, so I don't know. I think this is like a, a great way to get a directing job. But my question for you is, like you said, it's probably not saying, it probably doesn't say staff director on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. So what are some keywords people can search for if they're trying to find a job like this? Oh, and by the yeah. way, these jobs sure. exist all over the world. It's not like an LA market thing, right? Like everyone yeah, yeah. wants to create content for social media, for retail, for, you know, B2B stuff. I and, I think honestly, the director is the worst word you can use because <laughs> right. it it's means, such a corporate word. It's such a corporate word. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, I'm not director level yet or maybe you know, whatever. Like, um, yeah, senior director, all that stuff doesn't really help. I think you need to use words like video. Video is maybe the most important. Right. Um, I was going to say creative, but video is probably... Video is more important than creative. Because creative, even creative director, which is meaningful in advertising, there are creative directors in software. There's all sorts of different creative roles that have nothing to do with what we're talking about. Video is a great word to search for. I I wouldn't... I think... If you're willing to waste some time, maybe try type in creative and video in the same search. Um, Because I think there, the the types of jobs we're talking about looking for here is like making, hopefully making some cool stuff. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and by that, I mean stuff people are excited and, and trying to catch eyeballs and be interesting with. And, you know, even when you were at team win, you had all sorts of, rules about Mm -hmm. right metrics and data and things that were driving like business goals, Mm -hmm. but you still got to shoot cool things and do cool visual effects and be do comedy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just wouldn't want people to lose that, that part of the job. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's the, the catch with those jobs is that you're on a finite number of accounts, whereas a freelancer could be shooting a Coke spot one week and, uh, you know, uh, Samsung spot the next, right? Yeah. That's the, that's the real drawback. And I think that 
if you're like, oh, I'm on this one account or I'm only under this brand or whatever, the right. creative I'm just side, doing iPhone commercials I'm too all day. good for this. Yawn. You know, like, I think that, look, there is the reality that you want your reel to have a lot of different brands on it right or styles or looks or whatever like if it if it's if you just worked for one company and it's just iphone commercials yeah i mean i was kind of joking but yeah. yeah but I, I know but that but that's kind of your best say say you got an in-house job at apple Marcom job at apple or whatever and you just did top tier iphone marketing yeah. materials all the time they would look incredible they'd be great but it people would be like oh yeah well you just you know this one brand have you ever done anything else for anybody else yeah i probably i feel like you'd be pretty set like you know tony franklin our buddy he was a a creative at target Mm -hmm. and that's like his that's his pickup line it's like hey how's it going i'm tony i used to be on the agency side at target Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in-house and now i do this you know and that is an apples to apples comparison because but that we named two of the best advertising brands in the current right. landscape. But uh, Tony also is all about a passion project. Anytime things were down, he was going to shoot a doc or like pick something up or, you know, he was always so, so his portfolio wasn't just target. Right. But I think his Even first maybe big target, campaign target might be the best place to be in house. Yeah, but when his first big campaign was, I think, for Etsy, you know, as a director, Mm -hmm. that kind of got him a lot of attention. And it very much, you could see how a creative at Target would be great for a campaign at Etsy or on Etsy. Um, Yeah. So anyhow, I I don't know. I think I think this is cool. I think this is, you know, if things don't work out for me here, I might I might do this. Yeah. LinkedIn job search thing. Let's get to our third way of getting a directing job, which is. It, it's kind of related to the other two ways, but it's kind of its own thing, which is pitching your ideas mm-hmm. to people that are looking for ideas. And then yeah, d- this is the development thing, right? Yeah. yeah. But the second part is pretty important because, you know, when Matt and I started making this list, we didn't want we like we didn't want to just say original work. Just make your own stuff. You know, mm-hmm. obviously that's what the podcast is about, but, and you should be doing that, but that's not, what, yes. Yeah. There's a, a difference between like, Oh, I want to write this movie and make it or pitch it or whatever. And knowing that, Hey, uh, this company, you know, Lionsgate mm-hmm. is looking to make like 10 or, or, uh, Hulu is doing this after hours or, or a monthly, didn't they do like a, a horror series where they every had a Blumhouse yeah, one monthly. per month. Yeah. Yeah. So a January horror film, a February horror film, a March horror film. And, Maybe you think of Memorial Day, you know, that's in May and you're like, no one else is going to pitch on this. And I have an amazing horror Mm -hmm. idea for a Memorial Day thing. And I just Mm -hmm. met this person that works at Hulu. This dad is obsessed with this cowboy tub in his backyard. (laughs) Yes. He wants to get it done Memorial Day is coming up. Everyone boils to death. Uh, So to me, that's the distinction is there is it's not a directing job that exists but there is a search for some ip or like a, an mm-hmm, idea mm-hmm. and if you you know like meet enough yeah. people in network whether it's online whether it's in person whether it's like you know that a company is looking for a certain type of thing and you go and present to them why you should be making this thing for them yeah and and i think there's kind of two different um tiers to what you're describing there's your big studio networky sort of world where it's like okay each of those different companies has a mandate right you know they've got a house style they're like freeform is looking for this or whomever is looking for that and then there is the tier that i think is maybe a little bit more accessible for people where it's like smaller companies shutter needs 35 horror movies and they've already got three slashers and they need a you know, a, a sleepover feature, movie or a yeah. creature feature or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Monster of the Week thing. Um, that stuff tends to be a little bit more attainable because the thing that's tricky is that like the higher up you get, the more credentials and more of a package you need to have basically. And right. so I think you and I both got started when the marketplace was a little bit more excited about digital creators in particular. Like that was a new mm-hmm. thing. 
where do you think there's opportunity right now for people just starting out who are looking to pitch to specific brands? So, you know, the second movie I made was a Lifetime movie. Mm-hmm. Yep. Off of literally, I'd made one feature. Mm-hmm. They saw it. And, you know, obviously you've, you've heard of it. But it, my feature, it did fine. It premiered in AFI. I got some mm-hmm. awards, but it didn't win Sundance. It didn't get the yeah. Palme d'Or. It's not yeah. like... You could prove that you made a movie that they would like and that people like, but it's not... You didn't... Yeah. You weren't it's not a, a top 1%, you know, yeah. film festival. Yeah. But the second movie was a Lifetime movie because they needed someone competent and the the people that wrote the movie used to work at Lifetime and they knew mm-hmm. that Lifetime needs these mother daughter thrillers that mm-hmm. they put out a new one every single mm-hmm. month, you know? And so you can come to them and say, Hey, here's my idea for a mother daughter thriller. Like a lot of this probably comes from a, a writing standpoint, mm-hmm. but also as a director, uh, the, so I, I made one Lifetime movie and then they came to me with another one another Lifetime movie after that. And it seemed to me like almost the exact same movie. So I turned it down, but the guy that ended up taking it really made it into like this action movie. Mm -hmm. And then he was just kind of like the action director. And they, he, he, I think he made like two or three other movies with them because they just wanted an action movie Mm -hmm. director, Mm -hmm. you know, they could also kind of do the the lifetime relationship stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lifetime liked. So, yeah. Yeah. uh, But you know, that, that was like, 10 years ago. Um, Mm -hmm. I I think the thing that is important to think about with lifetime and it's kind of like a, a good marker is like uh, these places that have just a lot of output, a lot of volume, right? mm -hmm. Like, Oh, what are the, like shutter comes to mind as like, Oh, they are putting out original movies pretty frequently. Right. There was like Mar Vista back mm-hmm. in the day was mm-hmm. making like a hundred movies a year sure. or something. And there's still a feeder to, you know, Lifetime and Hallmark and a lot of those places. Yeah. I think Mar Vista is still making a lot of movies. Right. And then there was Hulu. I mean, you know, two years ago, Netflix, <laughs> like, sure. right. The joke was that you call them and they're like, hi, what can we green light for you today? And uh, I think that is absolutely not the case <laughs> today, yeah. this week. But uh, I think if you pivot a little bit from those more obvious examples to like the social media people, mm-hmm. like, you know, I worked on this thing with Jason Derulo and he has a guy that he literally met at the gym that told him he's a big fan of his videos and he likes to make videos. And he's like, come over, let's make some videos. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now the guy works for him and they, I mean, he puts out a video a week and each video gets, you know, 10 million views. Sure. So, uh, you know, Hayden Hillier Smith, who I've endorsed on the podcast, uh, Logan Paul's editor, who is now his own, you know, content creator, you know, got linked up to Logan Paul editing his stuff and became a filmmaker in his own right with a huge distribution platform. Uh, so I think a lot of influencers, I mean, you're working with an influencer. We all, you know, worked a lot with influencers in the past. I think, that is like a pretty accessible place. Like, let's say you see someone that you're a huge fan of I online. I think the term influencer is gone. I think that's passe now. I think you just say creator. Yeah, I guess like in, in the corporate world, like at Viacom, for instance. Sure. And they, they still say influencer still marketing like, and they have numbers. They have micro influencers and they have mm-hmm. like the, like if you have less than, uh, you know. 20, I guess maybe it's like creators uh, are a little bit more agnostic. Yeah. They still have niches, but like, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. You and I guess like in terms up. of oh, wow. marketing and money and all that stuff, like, yeah, may, maybe influencer is a little dated, but, um, but, but people are making so much content online mm-hmm. nowadays. And I promise you every single one of them is going to burn out <laughs> at some point and needs help. And you could approach someone that you're a huge fan of, like, Mm -hmm. you know, like Zach King, who I've like loved for like many years. Like he has a whole army of people. And I know people that have directed, you know, Colin Levy, who's like a a listener of our podcast has directed a bunch of things for Zach. That's Uh, cool. I didn't know that. That's exciting. Yeah. And so there's, there are a lot of outlets um, where you can just kind of be a director that's available to create content for people, but you have to be proactive about it. You have to come and say like, Hey, I'm, I do visual tricks. I'd love to direct some things for you. Like I'm, you know, you look at the corridor digital guys, like I'm sure 
everyone that works for them was probably a fan first that came and became mm -hmm. an employee. Uh, so I think there are a lot of interesting opportunities here. And of course there is the, the shutters and the, mm -hmm. you know, Mar Vistas and the more traditional. Yeah, no, I think you bring up a really good point because it's easy to think of lamenting, Oh, the funnier dies or college humors or Adam films or comedy.com. All those places are gone now, but they have been replaced by either those kind of smaller media brands or more pertinently, I think like creator driven channels that still have the same sort of viewership of what we were talking about. Like the difference between a college humor and a Mr. Beast is Mr. Beast is a, you know, multi-billion dollar <laughs> media empire. Do you know what I mean? And I, I wouldn't have thought of them in the same breath, but like, it's much more accurate to say that like those mega channels have as much career viability as, as those places before, you know? Yeah. Right now you're working at a network, right? That, uh, sure. Yeah. Works with a lot of different creators and things. And we've been in corporate buildings with HR companies for yeah, HR departments. Well, yeah. It, with, with HR departments and staffs and all of that and snacks and stuff, real businesses that all have a need for directors. A, and we're just YouTube channels, I guess is what I'm saying. Like it's easy to overlook because a lot of them, I think, still try to feel homemade or homespun or something but like you know all of that's bis big business and has tons of opportunity to to create cool things and the line is really blurry i think between hollywood and that like i'm sure will smith has you know uh, someone on staff yeah, yeah. that makes videos for him yeah i i think there's a lot of uh companies i know there are a lot of companies that specialize now and not just commercials and branded content but also running channels for in particular uh like traditional media stars who need to have a, a broader base now like will smith or brie larson comes to mind any any athlete like all those people like if you're gonna age out if you're a superstar and then you're gonna like turn i don't know 35 or 40 and like no longer be able to play basketball and aren't a good presenter or there aren't presenting you know, announcer jobs available and you still want to sell sneakers and right. or even if you're, yeah, like a Michael Jordan or yeah. Barry Sanders or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah. I think even like, like I've done some Steph Curry videos on right. his YouTube channel. That's a perfect yeah. example. So he, you know, there's him and LeBron and a few people that have like these empire, like entertainment yeah. empires. And I'm sure even like a bad robot or like some of these companies that belong to filmmakers that are pitching a lot of shows and things need, people making video content for these pitches and things. So yeah, I, it's again, it's like, I guess it's, it's, I feel like this is kind of morphing into the in-house job, but it's mm -hmm. different in that. These are places you can pitch to is what I'm saying. Yeah. But there are more places than you would think initially than like networks exclusively. Yeah. And like a really ancient example that uh, from probably like the fourth episode of our podcast or something is Tim Nakashi, who literally saw like the drummer from OK Go in a Pinkberry and said to him, I have an awesome idea for an OK Go video. And with no background <laughs> whatsoever. I forgot that's how it happened. That's how long ago this episode is. The drummer said, OK, here's my email address. Send us the idea. <laughs> and <laughs> he literally had no idea. <laughs> and he came up with one over the weekend and sent it to them and he got the job directing a video for them and it launched his career. That's so so that's, that, that is kind of what I'm talking about. And it does require some chutzpah as we say, where, you know, you need to approach people and you need to say, I'm, I'm a solution for this problem. You might not even know you have. Those are our three ideas. Yeah. Three and, and that's different than, Oh, I've got a great idea for a movie or a TV show, which I think is also part of that recipe but perhaps we're a little more familiar with yeah and i think you know the, the traditional like art conquers all or like if you make mm -hmm. something good it will get sold the cream yeah. rises to the top whatever the saying is it, that is still a thing still write your amazing screenplays mm -hmm. make your amazing shorts do your amazing things mm -hmm. but uh if you want to get paid as a director 
I think these three ways we talked about today, just, you know, getting reps hard to do when you're starting out, but as you get farther in your career, leveraging your, your body of work to get people to sell you, right? Most obvious way. Number two, in-house job at place, finding like Mm -hmm. a job on LinkedIn or something. And number three, or finding people that are looking to create video content, looking to create movies, looking to create something specific and bringing them that thing that they need. Whether it's a horror movie to Shudder or a video maker to, you know, Jason Derulo that you see at the gym. I think uh, those are all kind of the, the ways that we have recently been thinking about getting jobs. Well said, Oren. If you have any comments or thoughts about things that we missed, you can always hit us up on social media at Just Shoot a Pod across all social or email us email us at Just Shoot a Pod at gmail.com. Um, Oren, do you have a few more minutes to endorse? Yeah, let's do it. Unpaid endorsements. So my unpaid endorsement is a sparkling beverage called Nixie. Do you know this brand? Nixie, N-I-X-I-E. It sounds familiar, but I don't. They're don't in know. like health food uh, sort of. Yeah, it's like a LaCroix contemporary, but or like a spin drift, but less sweet than those other ones. Um and but more flavorful than the LaCroix. Like it's a it tastes like something, not just the hint of something. Um and specifically, I love their ginger lime Nixie over ice or just like a cold can. Delicious. As refreshing as you could hope for. So that's my endorsement. On a hot summer day, a a ginger lime Nixie is delicious. Kaplan, what you got? My endorsement is Fly first class. Like why, <laughs> why would you want to fly coat? Yeah. You know? Yeah, you that's true. Better food, more leg room. Mm-hmm. Unless you're vegetarian, in which case you get the same food. The same food, more mm-hmm. leg room. You get mm-hmm. to board before everyone else. You mm-hmm. get to get off the plane before everyone else. You never have to deal with the uh, no room for your overhead baggage mm-hmm. bullshit. Um, I, I would love to see the stats on... Um, what first class, and I know I'm burying your joke. I'm sure you had a punchline here somewhere, but like, I feel like first class now is just like what coach was when we were children or back of the day or whatever. Like first class just feels like an appropriate amount of space for a person. Whereas coach just feels like the least amount of space they are legally allowed to give you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's all just so crazy. Uh, and yeah, obviously that was a joke endorsement. Uh, I'm going to talk about another super obvious one. <laughs> so mm. I was just setting it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I talked to you about this. I mean, you don't have photo. any insight on coach. You were just tell, bring, bringing up that you, uh, you flew first class recently and that that's the joke. Oh no. The joke is to like endorse something that is, mm. it's like endorsing mm-hmm. a five star hotel versus if a two star hotel. Means I highly recommend picking one up. Yeah. Uh, get a job that pays a lot of money. It's a Ferris Bueller uh, quote. Oh yeah. Um, no, it's just, just joke endorsements. No, my real endorsement is incredibly obvious, but I felt like if I came up, remember the one time I endorsed an iPhone, (laughs) um, I feel like it will make this feel slightly less obvious just (laughs) relatively, but it's what I talked to you about right before, uh, we did this and that you said you've been seeing on TikTok nonstop, but it's this Photoshop generative fill. If you have a, an Adobe Creative Cloud account, depends when you listen to this. Right now it's in the Photoshop beta. If you install it, it is just magic. You can select any part of any image, type in what you want to replace that part of the image with. Like for instance, I you know outlined mm-hmm. your eyes and wrote sunglasses and it put sunglasses on your eyes and I mm-hmm. erased mm-hmm. the microphone in front of your face and it somehow created a mouth. To, to varying degrees of... Um believability yeah yeah. sometimes it's the tiktoks obviously they only post the great ones i did see one person who was like who did like a joke version where Mm -hmm. they just used the worst examples and it was funny well so my endorsement the nuance in it is that the for me why this is super useful is i am a huge fan of content aware phil i use it Mm -hmm. probably five days a week. Uh, and that's a feature in Photoshop also after effects, but mainly in Photoshop where you can have Photoshop guess, uh, when you have, you have something missing, right? Like 
you have a C stand in front of a person and you want to race the C stand, it tries to guess what that person would look like. But it's more of an educated clone stamp. Yes, exactly. It, it's trying to copy elements from around that area to mm-hmm. fill it in mm-hmm. uh, and average smoothly. Them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whereas generative fill. Yes, it looks at the entire image, uh, compares it, you know, using AI to a database of other images and or other AI hashes or whatever, however AI works uh, and figures out. So for instance, I, or I had a picture of you with a microphone blocking your mouth. I, I did the generative fill on the microphone and it drew a new mouth on your face mm-hmm. that it mm-hmm. did not have any information because about. The said, AI said, oh, okay, I can tell that this is a face mm-hmm. and that this part is where the mouth goes and this is the angle of the face. And so I'm going to compare that with a bunch of other faces that I know about and make a rough guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's way less yeah. intellectual than that, but that is basically the result. Yeah. Whereas the generative, whereas the content aware Phil would, like you said, just copy some eyeballs, some skin, some mm-hmm, anything mm-hmm. it sees around where the microphone was and give you some bizarro uh, result. And so the place I think this is the most useful for is if you want to change, if you want to make a picture wider, so if you're uh, making a deck or a treatment or a lookbook and you're like, oh, this image is great, but I wish this person was on the left side, but I don't have, you know, more pixels on the right side. You can literally just, uh, you know, make your image twice as wide and do a generative fill. So it's amazing. Photoshop generative fill. Check it out. Oh, the last thing. I haven't talked politics for a long time mm-hmm. on the podcast, but Today, uh, May 28th, there was a uh, Biden and McCarthy. They have some sort of agreement to raise the debt ceiling that will cl- include some spending caps. And who knows if it'll pass? You know, people mm-hmm. on the right are not happy about it. People on the left are not happy about it. But I'm, I, I don't know. It's kind of like oddly made me very happy to see. Oh, it's nice. Um, you know, people trying to solve it. Yeah. Maybe we're going to avoid genuine cataclysm i don't know i feel like biden played it in a a little bit of like this trumpy way which Mm -hmm. normally would be an insult but in this case is a compliment which is the like hey you guys are creating the problem and i'm just gonna go with the flow we'll try to figure it out if not then it's your fault he's Mm -hmm. trying to not own the the impending doom Mm -hmm. and in doing so kind of left this opening to negotiate which I don't know. I'm yeah. I, I, in general. I just like he said. I'm cut the malarkey. Yeah, I'm excited to see two people that a lot of people hate and think are on extreme ends of the spectrum work together. And uh, yeah, that um, that makes me happy. So I don't know. Sorry mm-hmm. to get political, but mm-hmm. um, I feel like I haven't talked politics for a long time on the show, and it's barely, barely. It's not even an opinion on anything. That's all I got. Hey, another good one. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the dead ceiling. Uh, email us at just shoot it pod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Matt maybe doesn't want to hear from you, in which case you can just DM me. I'm at O Kaplan on Instagram. Um, and I'm at Mr. Matt Enlow across all social media. This episode was edited by Noah Bayshore. Thanks, Noah. Our producer is Tyler Small. Thanks, Tyler. And you're listening to music provided by the free music archive and the artist Jazar. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.